Hi folks, um, today I wanted to talk to you about the um, long chain of islands that, that run off the, the west coast of Scotland. Now uh, these islands are called the Outer Hebrides, um, that's their official title as it were, um, but they're often called um, the Western, I <coughs> Western Isles, so you may very, may very well may hear them being referred to as the Western Isles. Um, so anyway, these are the, the large chain of islands um, that, that run down the extreme um, western coast of Scotland. Um, and they're comprised of, of the islands of uh, Lewis and Harris, um, North Uist, Benbecula, South Uist and Barra, um, plus many, many uh, smaller islands, um, uh, often ones that are uninhabited. Um, just to highlight, a, a key point here is that uh, you'll often hear Lewis and Harris being referred to almost as separate islands, so you'll hear them talking about the, the Isle of Harris or the Isle of Lewis. In actual fact, they are one island. Um, Lewis lies to the north, Harris to the south, but you, you'll often hear them referred to that, that way. Um, so these islands, the Outer Hebrides, are not to be confused um, with the group of islands called the Inner Hebrides, which lie um, much closer to the west coast of Scotland and include islands, well-known islands such as um, Skye and Isla and, and places like that. Um, so they are called the, the Inner, Inner Hebrides. So if you remember, Inner Hebrides are all closer to uh, Scotland. The Outer Hebrides are the ones that run pretty much in a line right down the extreme west uh, coast. Um, so they are, the islands are pretty sparsely populated um, and the total population at the moment is about um, uh, 28,000 um, and the main bulk of which live on Lewis. So Lewis is where you'd find the main bulk of the population living. Um, the administri administrative centre of the Western Isles or the Outer Hebrides, whichever name we're going to use here, um, is Stornoway, which is uh, in Lewis, um, on the, the east coast of Lewis, and it has a population of um, about 8,000 people. So it's not, not a hugely uh, large town. Um, historically, the islands have had a much larger populace um, going back centuries. Th th there was many more people lived there. Um, but over the past hundred years, mostly you've, you've seen you know, a gentle population decline. Um, however, uh, since the turn of this century, um, that appears to have been arrested. Um, and in recent years, uh, there's been a, a modest increase in population. So it's perhaps stabilized out and maybe going up slightly. Um, one of the key features about this unique um, chain of islands is that it's, it's formed of some of the oldest rocks, certainly in Europe, if not in the world. So that, that's what makes them. Um, and they, they were formed in the, the, what's called the Precambrian Age, um, which is three billion years ago. So these rocks have been around a long, long time. Um, and that's what forms this dramatic scenery uh, you would see um, on these islands. Um, so they were first really, as, as far as I'm aware, I can find out uh, the Outer Hebrides were first settled um, up over 6,000 years ago. Uh, settlers first came to them. Um, and there are a number of um, quite important prehistoric sites uh, on the island. Um, there's one called Clad Hallen um, on South Uist, which is the only site in the United Kingdom where prehistoric mummies have been found. Um, and there's also very impressive ruins um, of, a, of a broch um, at uh, Duncarloway Broch on Lewis. Um, and uh, both these sites, they date from the Iron Age. However, the most important uh, prehistoric site uh, in the Western Isles are the standing stones of Callanish. 
which uh, again are on Lewis, um, and they are 5,000 years old, dating from round about 2,900 BC. Um, so they're older than Stonehenge, for instance. Stonehenge, obviously, you'll often hear mentioned um, a very important site, but actually the Callanish stones predate Stonehenge. Um, and they are considered to be the finest example um, of, of a, a stone circle, um, certainly in, in the United Kingdom, um, if not further afield. So they, they consist of, of a circle of, of 13 large stones, very large stones. So there's 13 of them. And it has a huge stone in the middle, which is called the monolith, the huge monolith stone. Um, and then there's also a chambered tomb kind of near the middle as well. Um, now from this circle, uh, five rows of, of smaller standing stones uh, fan out and they are in the shape of a cross. Um, now obviously this site predates Christianity so it couldn't have been done with that in mind um, but it certainly is in the shape of a cross. What you have is two long rows running almost parallel to each other. Um, they create a kind of avenue, as it were, and so they run to the north. Um, and then there are shorter um, rows of stones running out um, to, the, to the west and the south and the east. Um, and the stones are all made of, of the this, this same type of rock called Lewisian Neath, uh, an ancient type of granite uh, that's found on Lewis and th so they were obviously all uh, mind carved uh, locally. The key thing I think for us all to understand really is that nobody knows why these amazing stones were erected. I mean there are numerous, hundreds, probably thousands of theories but in actual fact historians and archaeologists w will all admit that nobody really knows. There are, so some of the, the, the favourite ones are that, that uh, this could have been a, a sort of astronomical uh, observatory um, or, that, or that they were used in, in rituals relating to the moon and the stars. Um, th there obviously is no written word has come down from the, the time of them but the, the first one of the first written references um, to the stone was written in 1695 uh, by a, a Scottish author Martin Martin um, and he visited the site and he was told um, by local people that the stones were a, a place appointed for worship in the time of heathenism and that the chief druid or, or priest stood near the big stone in the centre um, from whence he addressed uh, himself to the people um, that surrounded him. So that is, you know, that is a written record of, of a Scottish author uh, recording what he said local people uh, told him. Um, so I think that would give, give us a very good inkling as to, to their use. However, whatever their, their purpose the one thing that is known about the Kalanish stones is that they, they remained an important place for whatever ritual activities that took place here uh, for at least 2,000 years. So it's not as if this was something that just was a sort of flash in the pan. So for 2,000 years, um, whatever it was they were used for was taking place at that amazing site. Um, and I think that's why, you know, obviously the stones are fantastic stones and it's a, such a wonderful site to visit. But the fact that, to me, that this was such an important place for 2,000 years, um, I think, highlights how important it is. Um, and certainly, you know, it, it, it certainly makes a huge impact on me whenever I'm, I am there. Um, so moving on from then, uh, the Celtic Iron Age way of life in the, in the Outer Hebrides um, came to a sudden end and uh, you could say it was very rudely interrupted um, by the Vikings who started raiding Scotland um, towards the end of, of the 8th century. Um, 
So, and gradually the, the, the islands fell under the control of, of the Norse warriors. Um, uh, so in, in the Western Isles, a uh, uh, Norse warrior called um, Kettle Flatnose, which I presume was an indication of his looks, um, he became the dominant warlord for, for the Western Isles um, and during the mid 9th century. Um, and then in 1098, um, the Norse control over this whole area was formalised when uh, King Ed Edgar of Scotland um, capitulated and he, he formally signed the islands over uh, to King Magnus III of Norway. So really then, that these lands were, were ceded to, to Norway and to the Norsemen and to the, to the Vikings. Um, unfortunately, the, the local population, the local Celtic Iron Age tribes, suffered greatly uh, as a result of this um, as, as the, the Vikings tended to impose their rule um, with sword and fire so it was a, a very hard time for, for the, the local um, Celts. So the, the, the Vikings didn't just control the Outer Hebrides they really controlled all the islands uh, around uh, the north and, and west coast of Scotland uh, right down to and including the Isle of Man so those of you know Isle of Man really lies off the, the coast of England um, and they called this Kingdom of the Isles um, and it had two parts the North Isles really were uh, Orkney and Shetland so if you, people know where they are they are up to the, the north of Scotland um, and the South Isles were the Outer Hebrides, the Inner Hebrides uh, and the Isle of Man. Uh, and I think at some, some time they also had uh, part of the, the land uh, uh, of Scotland uh, in Argyll and um, around about there. So quite a substantial part of Scotland for a long time uh, was run by the Norse Vikings um, or Norway whichever you know whichever phrase we want to use a very well-known artifact that you may have heard about um, from this period are the famous Lewis chessmen uh, and they were discovered in Uig um, on the Isle of Lewis if you've ever been there Uig um, in 1831 and they're carved mostly from wal walrus ivory uh, and it's felt likely that the chess men were made in Trondheim uh, which was the, the medieval capital um, of Norway and it's felt they were made in the 12th century um, so these uh, chess men are on display in the British Museum and also uh, up in the museum I think in Stornoway um, for people to view so absolutely fantastic very well known image, images um, so for 500 years, as we said, for 500 years, this part of Scotland was not run, was not part of Scotland and was certainly not run from Scotland. It was ruled from Norway, 500 years, um, until 1266, uh, when uh, the Scots uh, beat the Vikings at the Battle of Largs, quite a famous battle in our history. Um, and uh, the, the Vikings, the Norsemen, were really pushed right out of Scotland at that time and the islands returned to Scots rule. Um, as the Norse-speaking uh, princes departed, um, they were replaced by Gaelic-speaking clan chiefs who sort of stepped into the power vacuum, as it were. Um, and that included the Macleods up in Lewis, um, and Harris, uh, the Macdonalds on the Uists, North and South Uist, and the McNeils down in Barra. However, this change of rulers um, didn't really bring any peace to these troubled islands, I'm afraid, um, because what happened was the clans constantly were at war with each other, constantly fighting each other, constantly with grudges and, and, and feelings that they had to fight back um, and that really 
w was how it carried on. Um, eventually the McDonald's gained the upper hand and they then established their own kingdom called the, and, and they called themselves the Lord of the Isles, Lords of the Isles. Um, and they really had control then over all the the Outer Hebrides and the Inner Hebrides, um, but never uh, Orkney or Shetland. Um, so that is what happened then, you know, the Vikings are gone, uh, the clans took over, battled away, and eventually the McDonald's uh, came out on top. However, the McDonald's became um, a major thorn in the, in the side of the Scottish kings as they, they constantly tried to assert their independence um, from Scotland and from the Scottish crown. And this carried on all the time. So it was all always constant friction between whoever was the king ruling Scotland and the Lords of the Isles. Things came to a real head in 1493, however, when it was discovered that um, John MacDonald, uh, Lord of the Isles, had concluded a secret treaty uh, with Edward IV of England and um, what they had agreed was that they would both invade Scotland. Um, England would invade from the south and uh, the Macdonalds would invade from the west. Um, so King James IV of Scotland took action and stripped um, John MacDonald of all his ancestral lands and estates and titles and imposed royal control um, over the islands. But however that didn't really resolve it totally. Conflict continued for centuries afterwards um, and especially with the clans continually at war with each other. Um, so I'm afraid you, you can't really say that these lands uh, had a very peaceful time. Um, 500 years of Norse rule um, and then about another 500 years of clans battling each other and in conflict with the, the Scottish crown. So a terrible time really um, for, the, for these lands. Um, Fast forwarding a little bit, something else that I think that um, is quite important is that obviously this, for those of you that know it, this is where on the, the Outer Hebrides, the Western Isles, this is where Pony Prince Charlie first landed when he arrived in, in Scotland um, to pursue his, his ill-fated attempt um, to usurp the British Crown. So he landed on uh, the small island of Eriskay. Um, which is, uh, it's just between South Uist and Barra, so it's right down the bottom, Barra is the, is the last island really, and uh, Eriske, just a very little island. Uh, so he landed there uh, in July 1745 um, and went on then to, uh, to raise some of the clans and as you know the whole history of the, the Jacobite Rebellion. So after the failure uh, of the Jacobite Rebellion um, and, the, and the disaster of Culloden in 1746, um, Bonnie Prince Charlie fled back to the West Isles where he had first started uh, what you might call his adventure. Um, so he fled back to the West Isles um, and he hid there um, from, from the the uh, British army who were seeking to arrest him. And he travelled extensively uh, through the islands, constantly moving, constantly moving, constantly hiding. Um, but he was especially in South Uist um, and Benbecula. Um, and uh, there is a, today if you go there, there's a Bonnie Prince Charlie Trail um, so that you can follow that and you can, you can actually see sites and locations where, where he hid often just for a day or a couple of days and then he was moving on. Um, so th you know I think that would be very interesting for many many people um, and I find it interesting that he went back to the West Niles, that's where he landed and then when he's when he's running away he, he goes back there and, and tries his best to hide. Um, nowadays, fast forwarding to, to nowadays, um, life in, in the Western Isles uh, largely revolves, I think, around about tourism, it's very important, uh, crofting, that's small-scale farming, 
uh, fishing and weaving and I thought I'd talk about the weaving to you um, because the, the, the weaving industry uh, includes the manufacture of the famous Harris Tweed uh, now and I've got my Harris Tweed waistcoat on today <laughs> um, so for centuries uh, weavers uh, on um, uh, Lewis, Harris, Uist and Barra for centuries they had been recognised for their excellence in weaving um, and uh, but really up until the middle of the 19th century so in the 1800s um, they, they only wove for themselves so the cloth would be used for themselves or perhaps they would sell some um, at a local market uh, and also it, it became a form of currency and uh, crofters would often pay the rents uh, to the land uh, lords uh, with cloth um, with tweed however what what took it from that little uh, craft industry was that in 1846 practically the whole of Europe um, agricultural communities across Europe they were really suffering um, from what was called a potato blight which, which harmed the potatoes and drastically affected the, 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 the amount of potatoes that they were able to harvest um, and, and so many places across Europe Ireland in particular was obviously one of the worst affected of the whole of Europe uh, wherever populations had relied too much on potatoes then they, they were hardest hit but it did affect people in the Western Isles and, and they did face in, in 1846 they faced a potato famine um, so seeing the effect of this t uh, famine on, on the, the local population uh, Lady Catherine Murray who was the Countess of Dunmore and she was a, the, uh, an English lady who was the widow uh, of the Earl of Dunmore who was the main landowner on Harris um, and she saw what was happening but she also saw the potential uh, for the tweed that the, that the, the islanders wove uh, for that to become a sustainable and local industry so Lady Catherine had uh, the, the, the family t uh, clan Tartan Murray um, so her husband's uh, name was Murray and that was her clan so she had that Tartan woven in Harris Tweed um, and she kitted out her estate workers uh, now this the results of this proved very successful people were quite amazed and, and, and entranced by it as it were um, so she therefore devoted much of her time and effort after that uh, to helping the islanders uh, develop this and she she particularly wanted to improve the quality and the standard of the tweed and she did this by organizing and financing herself um, training for the weavers um, and but and then and also by marketing um, the tweed further afield especially down to into england so as a result, sales of the cloth took off and, and it very soon became established uh, with sales merchants right across Great Britain. And this is the beginning of, of the Harris Tweed industry, this moment. And, and that's what did it, you know. Um, so it, it became then a, a much sought after product, especially in, in, in the highest social circles. Um, and, and the weavers and the islands were kept very busy um, meeting the rising demand mills w were built in, in Lewis up in Stornoway uh, to help um, and one of the things that came out of that was because it was gaining such popularity uh, it became clear that steps would need to be taken to protect the tweed from people imitating it or counterfeiting the designs um, now we all hear about these things today but this is back in, in, in the early 1900s and this is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about Harris Street because I was so amazed at how they did this so that what happened was they, they, they called a meeting in Stornoway in 1906 and what was proposed then was a system whereby all tweed produced on the islands would be checked uh, for quality and if it was passed 
um, it would be given a certifying stamp. So this was in uh, 1906. In 1909, an association called the Harris Tweed Association was formed and it to run this, what you would call is a quality control system. Um, you know, one of the very earliest, I think, um, in, in the world. Um, and it registered its famous, um, it's called the Orb and Cross trademark. Um, so thanks to that meeting and thanks to, to the drive of the people involved and the vision, um, we have this genuine Harris Teed. So this waistcoat that I'm wearing today, I bought this on Nile Harris and I wanted it to be genuine Harris Tweed. Now in the back of it, there's a label and I'm going to put up on the screen now that label and you'll see. And that is proof that this is genuine Harris Tweed. So for it to be called genuine Harris Tweed and to have that label on it, and this is, uh, was, was approved by an Act of Parliament in the British Parliament. So it has to be, and here's the, the written definition, it has to be handwoven by the islanders at their homes in the Outer Hebrides, finished in the Outer Hebrides, and made from pure virgin wool, dyed and spun in the Outer Hebrides. So I think this is a magnificent thing. I love Harris Tweed. I have quite a lot of Harris Tweed jackets and waistcoats, and I just love them. Uh, and one of the things I like about it is, is its authenticity. Uh, it's a bit like, you might say, champagne. You know, real champagne. <laughs> excuse me saying real champagne because, excuse this, some, in America sometimes you call things champagne that aren't champagne. Anyway, champagne can only produ be produced in the Champagne region and it, is, it describes exactly how it has to be produced. Well, this is exactly the same. Here is a top quality product that you can buy with confidence thanks to this, um, uh, this great meeting that took place and, and the, the idea of setting up this authority. Um, so, if you're ever buying a Harris Tweed garment or an accessory, lots of handbags are made now of Harris Tweed, um, please make sure it carries what's called the Orb and Cross trademark. That's your guarantee that this cloth was woven in the manner prescribed um, by Parliament. Um, just a couple of other points to touch on. Uh, traditionally, the, the Western Isles uh, had the greatest number of Gaelic speakers uh, in Scotland. So this is really where Gaelic is uh, spoken and um, understood and used, uh, we might say properly as a language. Um, so however, unfortunately even there, um, the use of this language is in decline. Um, so as recently as the 1970s, for those of us who remember the 1970s, um, about 75% of all the people in the Western Isles uh, were Gaelic speakers. Um, but this has fallen recently and it's around about 50, I think, just over 50% at the moment. Um, however, still, it is the, the one place in Scotland where you will find many, many native Gaelic speakers. Um, one of the other things I love about the Western Isles is that you can, it's on the Western Isles, you can see examples of, of these houses that were called black houses. Um, and these were the houses, the types of houses that, that housed many crofting people uh, in the Scottish Highlands and Islands. Uh, and, uh, and there are still examples there. There's one at uh, Arnold and Lewis and... Um, ah, I've just forgotten the name of a little... There's a little village with them, <laughs> which is lovely as well. It will come to me, maybe. Um, so the Black House, which in Gaelic is, uh, not that I'm a Gaelic speaker, just to let you know, but it's Tai Do. Do, I think, is Black and Tai's house. Yeah, I think so. Tai Do. Uh, somebody, oh, please correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, so generally a Black House was a, a single story um, rectangular building with one door. Um, and if it had windows at all, they didn't always have windows. If they had windows, maybe just one or two. Um, and inside, in the middle of the floor, they would have an open hearth. So the fire burnt on the floor in the middle of the room uh, and the smoke uh, escaped 
through the, the thatched roof. Um, I have to say I don't think this was very healthy um, for them, but however, I have been in one of them many, many years ago. They're not allowed to do it now for health reasons, but I, many years ago, 30 years ago, I was in one and the fire was on and literally, you know, my eyes were running with the smoke. However, that was the, the fire it was like that. Um, so the, 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 the houses were thatched really with any suitable material, um, grass, heather, uh, the straw from barley, um, rushes, uh, and, and the roof would be held down by uh, large stones with string, so they, they were looped over, and that's really what kept, kept the roof on. Um, and every year the roof would be stripped, um, the blackened thatch, because the thatch would all go black, the smoke, um, the blackened thatch was taken off and it was used to f as a fertiliser in the fields and they would re-thatch it, so that happened every summer. Um, uh, so a feature of these black houses was that the, the crofters shared the black house with their livestock, with their animals, normally cattle I would think, but you know. Um, and really what they had was the people lived at one end uh, and the animals at the other and in the middle was a simple kind of wooden partition um, and the floor uh, on the, the side where the people uh, were w was generally flagstones, not always but I, I, I think it was generally flagstoned or stoned uh, but where the beasts were it would just be earth um, but you know this uh, this type of house was ideally situated, suited, sorry, for for the for the climate it had. So what it had was dry stone walls, and there were double dry stone walls. Dry stone walls means there's no mortar involved in building it, and it's a feature in Scotland. You often see walls, and they 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 will stand for hundreds and hundreds of years because there's no mortar to crumble, and if they're built properly, and the air can get through, the wind can get through, so they would have double dry stone walls. Uh, has a very low roof, so for me to get in, I had to duck away down. Um, so it's got a low profile, so with these winds sweeping in off the Atlantic, you know, it can survive that. Um, and the thatch insulates it. Um, so they, they were really suitable for this wild weather that they, they get up there in, in the Outer Hebrides. Um, and in a way, they were in a way in advance of themselves because they were very eco friendly, if you want to use a sort of modern expression, eco friendly. Um, and that the, the, the building materials were all natural and they were all locally sourced, you know, so it was just they built them from whatever they could find. Um, so it's, if you ever were in uh, the West Niles, try and go to one of the black houses. They're, they're absolutely amazing to see them. Girinan, I think, is the village. Somebody will tell me I've got that wrong. Girinan, yeah, where you can see black houses as well. Memory going. Um, so, just touching on that then, it's tourism, uh, you know, has been a, a great boost to the local economy and I would say to the Western Isles, it's a great holiday destination. Um, there's a great, there's a lot to see and do, especially if you like the outdoors. It's obviously not a sort of city centre break as it were. Um, I think one of the great things for me was it lies right on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. And you get a peace and tranquility here that's that's hard to find. You know, the weather can be atrocious, it can be blowing a gale and rain, but there's a, a peacefulness about that. And I remember once being up um, the, the uh, western coast of Lewis, way up the top of Lewis, looking out, and it was, oh my goodness, it was wild and windy, but I was looking out there thinking, you know, there's nothing here, between. I don't think much between here and Canada and America and this great Atlantic Ocean sweeping in. And uh, yeah, I, I, I really liked it. Um, but you know, there are things like there's stunning beaches. I mean, absolutely stunning beaches, especially down in Harris. Oh my goodness, stunning beaches. Superb sea views. And as always in Scotland, you just have to grasp the moment. You know, it'll be there and then it'll be gone you know, 10 minutes later. Huge amounts of history, especially prehistoric history. Um, lots of wildlife, so if you like wildlife spotting, and uh, you, you certainly can do that. And if you like outdoor activities, I'm sure, I mean, there's lots of walking to do if you like walking. 
um, but you could do cycling, canoeing, kayaking, things like that, windsurfing I think you can do. So there's lots of activities like that. You can have a very active uh, holiday if you wish. Um, and it's, it's relatively easy to get to the Western Isles. Um, you can fly, so you can fly to Stornoway, or if you fancy something different, and I've done this, you can fly, I think you can still do this flight, you can fly to Barra, uh, and you land there on the beach. It's a very small plane, <laughs> and obviously the tide has to be out, thank goodness, so you know, you're coming in thinking, I hope the tide's out, and it's just this big expanse of beach, and then the plane goes and runs along the beach, and then at the end of it is this very small little terminal thing just on the, on the beach. So I, I personally found that great. Um, or you can fly to Stornoway in a much bigger plane. Uh, or you can go by ferry with Caldo and McBrain, uh, the ferry company, and you can also get an island, what's called an island hopper ticket. So if you want to say, I don't know, you could fly to Stornoway for instance, hire a car and then drive down and you can get an island hopper ticket too. Or you could go by ferry to Stornoway and then come off at the bottom to Barra. So you're going to go, you know, you're going to start at, if you want to start at the top and then come all the way down, or you can start at the bottom and go your way up. Um, there are causeways between some of the islands, so you don't have to necessarily get a ferry between every island. Um, so taking a car, I think, would be is quite a good way to see it, um, and you can do your own thing then. Um, the only thing is, usual, uh, the traffic is very light here of course but um, you would just have to watch out for I suppose um, cyclists and, and walkers and probably most importantly the wildlife so if you are on a car just ease back take it easy there's small roads anyway so you're not going to be going fast uh, and just enjoy it enjoy the time and everything like that so I think you know um, if you've ever thought about it you should go to the West Niles there's so much history to see there's so much natural beauty about the place um, and it's just a different way of life a different pace of life a different way of life um, you're not going to get everything you get in big urban con conurbations but then that's good maybe to get a break from that anyway I hope um, you've enjoyed this little insight into the to the Western Isles um, this has been a much longer video I could have gone on for the whole day I'm, I'm afraid I do, I do love the Western Isles um, as usual, if you like it, please um, <coughs> uh, perhaps like it or pass it on to your, or to your friends or whatever. I, I'm always keen for everybody to be able to, to see the videos. Um, comment by all means, please give me your comments. I love uh, getting comments um, and I try my best to reply to them. Um, so, uh, all that's left for me to say is uh, until we meet again, I just want to wish you all the very best from Scotland. <laughs>